All right. You're good to go. Okay. Yeah? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah? We needed your face. It's my big giant head. <laughs> cool. Oh, there I am. Hello. Testing. Okay. Good. Connected. Um, and I'll be interviewing Dave Rodden. So, um, instead of um, talking about the usual biography, um, Dave's life is actually quite interesting, so it's rather, I'll just say a couple of sentences and you'll, you'll fill in the, the rest. Okay, so, so um, Dave started out as a teacher, and then his introduction to being a raconteur is actually quite traditional in the, the old sense of how books were written, or storytelling was developed. Do you want to go into that? Yeah, so I started my career, I guess, as a uh, performance storyteller. Uh, Ireland has a long history of traditional storytelling, uh, and it's a weird one because even, so I have 10 uncles, and even my uncles who have not read a book since 1955, and all look like potatoes, pretty much, um, at Christmas, they will just stand up and do what we call a recitation. So each of them knows like a 10 minute long saga poem or short story and they will just rhyme it off completely because at, at home in Ireland, storytelling is kind of part of our DNA. And in Dublin, there is a, uh, a really kind of vibrant storytelling scene. And so I sort of cut my teeth as a, as a performer going to these places and doing sort of open open mic nights where I would tell stories about uh, things I'd written or Irish myths and legends or stupid things I'd done to impress girls. Uh, and uh, that's kind of where it was my first experience being in front of an audience. Okay, so now next. And then um, you, you went for an MA yes. in the University College of Dublin. And there you wrote the first chapter, this to again yeah so i i was doing all this storytelling and it was enjoyable and i was making absolutely no money off it and uh i was kind of caught in a i was 23 i was kind of caught between i thought i i really wanted to be a writer i really wanted to be a storyteller uh but my family were like you need to get a proper job you need to kind of grow up uh and so i got into teaching uh i taught for a year in egypt as you can tell, my amazing tan. And um, when I was over there, I got really into short story writing and I found the uh, MA in Creative Writing in UCD. And I thought to myself, this is a test. I will apply, I have to send in some of my work. And if they say no, then I should grow up, get a job, be a proper human being. And luckily they accepted me. And the first bit of homework we had was to write the first chapter of a book. So I wrote the first chapter of Nights of the Borrowed Dark and nobody liked it. Uh, <laughs> they were like, it's too dark, it's too weird, kids won't like this. And I was like, well, I'm gonna write it anyway. So I, um, I wrote the first draft, I redrafted it, um, I wrote it as part of my thesis. And then the November after I graduated, I sent it off to 25 different agents. And uh, 24 of them said no. And one of them said uh, that she liked it. And we worked on it a little bit together. And then she sent it off to uh, Puffin on my birthday, on my 25th birthday. And um, they came back to us in a week and said yes, which is really nice because it meant I could afford dinner. Uh, so I was quite pleased. Fantastic. This is a story within itself. Um, okay, so the. The trilogy is great. It's a complex, intertwined uh, story. I guess, basically, if I really want to summarize it, 
or maybe you should. But, oh dear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it took me three books to tell the story the first time. Um, so, um, Night of the Bar or Dark for me is kind of revenge on a lot of the sort of middle grade kid discovers magic tropes. I love that kind of fiction, but I knew growing up as a very shy and a very lonely kid that I was just not like those kids in those books. And also, uh, the kids in these books were always, the books were always set in England or they were always set in America. And I didn't recognize the personalities or the landscape there. So um, with Nights, uh, I set out to tell a story about a kid drawn into a magical world, because that is what I love. But every single time I felt like I was getting close to something that had been overdone or a trope, I would try and find my own version of it. So in Knights of the Bar Dark, there is a, an organization called the Knights of the Bar Dark who uh, protect our world from these uh, ravening shapeshifters called Tenebrous. I didn't want to get caught only using one type of monster. So every Tenebrous is like a horror movie in miniature. Every single one of them looks different. They are from outside our universe. So when they cross over, the lights flicker, um, the, the glass frosts over. Even looking at them makes you feel nauseous. They're very much not from here. And the Knights of the Bar of Dark are a group of uh, men and women who have a vicious magical fire inside them, which is a perfect weapon against these dark creatures. Uh, but this power, like all power, comes at a terrible cost because the more they use it, the more it turns them slowly to iron. So for me, that was my way of talking about the idea that if you had to fight a war every day of your life, it would change you. It would make you different. It would make you colder and harder. And so the knights, if you've been a knight for 10 or 20 years, your arms have all turned to iron. You, you don't go outside or interact with normal uh, people, with civilians, uh, because you know iron is sort of to spread through your face. Um, it's that separation between soldier and, and person who gets to have a normal life. And into all this comes 13-year-old Denison Hardwick, who has, is being recruited by the Knights, but has read all the books where a kid gets magic and is like, no thanks, I don't even like sports. Please leave me alone. Um, and he knows that uh, there, are, there are heroes and there are people who are automatically brave and he's just a kid and he is terrified most of the time and he sort of, I have a lot of anxiety as a person. Uh, I'm able to see the, I'm able to question things too much and Denison is like that. Um, most kids, if someone tried to draft into a magical organization would be like, oh, marvelous. And Denison's like, oh Jesus, um, help. Uh, and so it's about him moving through the nights, um, facing up to, he's not a chosen one, there's no prophecy or destiny. It's just about realizing that bravery is about being in the right place at the right time and making that right decision. And it gets more difficult the more you do it, but you begin to realize if you don't do it, nobody else will. Um, I have an uncle who's a firefighter in New York and um, he has been in so many burning buildings that his arms look like melted candle wax. And he, one of the stories he told me when I was a kid was that he was being lowered from, he from a helicopter onto a burning building. And there were, he was taking people from the burning building into the helicopter. And there's only two people left, a little old lady and her tiny terrier dog. So he got the old lady into the helicopter and he was going back down to the dog. And he was like, here boy, we gotta go. And the dog uh, was freaking out and lunged at him and went for his throat. And Declan managed to get his arm up in the way and the dog dug his fangs into uh, Declan's arm and Declan was left there on this burning skyscraper going, <laughs> pull me up! And so they pulled him up with his dog hanging from his, uh, from his arm. And I remember asking him like, you know, Jesus, you're so brave, you must not even think about how dangerous it is. And he was like, I think about it all the time. I know that every day at work could be my last. And I was like, well, why do you keep doing it? And he was like, well, sure, if I don't do it, who will? And I love the idea that like, you don't get any less scared because you keep doing it. You just keep doing it. Because if you don't do it, you know, it's going to be a terrier. No one's going to save all this stuff, so.
yeah, that was my big inspiration behind Knights. So there's like monsters and magic and, and shapeshifters and grossness and action and all that fun stuff. So. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was great. And I mean, there are lots of twists and turns and surprises. It's completely unpredictable. You don't, I mean, you don't know how, what's, what's going to happen, which character is going to crop up. <laughs> oh, Good. I, I, I really like that. Then there's also the references. There's a chapter named after a line in Faulty Towers. I would say that <laughs> So, I mean, did, was this all planned? I mean, did you create a blueprint or was there some, I don't know, was some spur of the moment idea, oh yeah, that sounds good, let's put that in, or? Um, it's kind of, it's kind of a mix. I don't want to ruin my authorly mystique and tell you that I made a lot of it up as I went along, but uh, I kind of made a, a lot of it up as I went along. <laughs> um, I knew, I knew the sort of uh, blanket idea or the tone of each book. I knew that it was going to be a trilogy. It was going to build up to this big apocalyptic finale and this big apocalyptic choice. Again, all coming down to this one moment where someone has to make a choice. But so much of the road there, I, I didn't know at all. Um, and I don't like to, to mystify writing because I think that if you, the second you think that a muse is directing your hands is the second you decide to take the day off because you're like, oh, muse is in here, but they're like, chill out, uh, play some video games. Um, so, but there were times during the book that I did feel like I was discovering it as opposed to just writing it. And what you're reading, and it must, it's, it's probably obvious, but it, it, should be, it should be said, is the culmination of um, six or seven drafts where I was redrafting book one as I was writing book two and planning book three. So I had this opportunity to foreshadow and to realize something here and then go back and make it make sense here. So um, you're really reading a, a sto one story in three parts. And I always think when you're writing a trilogy, the first book is you building a house. And the second book is you revealing new rooms to the house but not but still keeping to the original architecture you can't reveal brand new rules or or things it has to be just new elements to what's been set up before and then the third book is burning the house down hmm. so. we've been blowing it up actually. yeah we're blowing it up yeah as long as it's some destruction <laughs> i'm i'm happy um okay so i I don't know, the, the more, I guess, I internet stalk to, I guess, or <laughs> under the guise of research, maybe. But, um, research sounds <laughs> um, This is quite, is it autobiographical? And I mean, did you insert a lot of your life in this? You don't mind me asking. No, not at all. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it, I mean, I, it sounds basic, but I did write it. So everything in it mm -hmm. is a product of my interests, and what I like and what I don't like and what I find fascinating and and what I want to explore. The villains are very much what scares me. I um, like as a kid and uh, I love horror movies. So as soon as I watch a horror movie, I start working out how to defeat whatever's in the horror movie. And that's why my monsters are shapeshifters because you never get used to terror. You can never, the second you understand the first tenebrous you face, the next one will be completely different. Um, it's funny, looking back, a lot more of it seems autobio autobiographical than when I was writing it. I sort of cringe at the thought of writing about myself. I don't think I'm particularly interesting. I like coming up with stuff and what I come up with is cool. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't set out to sort of, I wouldn't knowingly set out to explore something about myself in a book. But then looking back, I did find that naturally through pulling on the things that I enjoyed, you, you do get to know me, I think, through the book. Uh, for example, my, my villains in the first book are called The Clockwork Three. And there's the man in the waistcoat, the woman in white, and the opening boy. And when I was creating them, I just wanted to create a sort of an antidote to the handsome, charismatic, has everything planned villain like the villain you know the villains who want to get caught so there could be that dramatic scene where they argue with the hero and they're in the glass box and stuff but i wanted to avoid that so my villains are incredibly petty and cruel and mean on a really small micro level because you don't need to be 
big or terrifying to hurt a kid. You just need to be slightly bigger and be cruel. And it was only after writing it um, that I realised I was bullied very badly when I was a kid. And my three villains are sort of the three sides of a bully. There's the man in the waistcoat who never does anything overt, but is just really just like pinpoint cruel and nasty in what he says. Um, and then there's the woman in white who is brute force. And then there's the opening boy who's a hurt kid, because that's what bullies are. And as somebody who in my early 20s would have had to completely lock off and ignore a large part of my childhood to keep going, putting them on the page and exploring bullies um, was really, I guess, cathartic and really interesting because I'd go, okay, well, what would really scare me at 13? But I was giving it to a character as opposed to, like, reliving it myself. And apparently, if you do read the books, it just sounds like I'm talking to you. I am... Um, uh, is, is anyone here um, an, an aspiring author? A few people? Cool, hello. Um, one big thing that I tried to do when I was uh, starting off was I... When I was starting off writing was I wrote like other people. So I always say that I was a Neil Gaiman cover band for a couple of years. Um, and I never tried writing like Terry Pratchett because who can? Um, but I would take on other people's voices. And Nights of the Bar of Dark was the first thing that I wrote like myself. It was the first, I was, I was on a deadline, I was stressed out and I was just like, oh, I'll just write the way that I would tell a story or the way that I would talk to a friend. And apparently that really comes across in the books. It just sounds like, like my friends will really go, it just sounds like you, Dave. And I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, so that was a really interesting, like I think that, I think you do need to write like other people for a while, but eventually you just circle around to your own voice. Cause that's what people want to hear at the end of the day, I think. Yeah, very good, very good, thanks. So, um, moving on. Now we've got the Doctor Who book. My big chunky boy. Uh, <laughs> the, well, stalking stuffer maybe. Uh, so um, this is a, I wouldn't say a reinterpretation, but it's, it's a Doctor, 12 Doctor Who stories, but through the eyes of Doctor Who villains. How did this come about? Uh, it's funny that you say like kind of reinventing thing. I got in so much mm -hmm. trouble because a, 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 a newspaper at home uh, wrote an article about, about 12 Angels Weeping saying, meet the Irish author who's reinventing Doctor Who. And I got a bunch of emails from Doctor Who fans saying, and, and who are you? And uh, why do you think you're reinventing it? I was like, I'm not. I swear to God, I'm not. Um, the, this book came about because uh, the BBC, BBC Books got in touch and uh, they wanted a, a Christmas anthology and they wanted it to be centred on each of the villains. So there are 12 stories, each one focuses on a different iconic Doctor Who monster. And it was a lot of fun to write because I decided that it would basically be my chance to write a season of Doctor Who. Uh, and so each story is a different genre, has a different voice, is set in a different world. Some of them don't have the Doctor. Some of them uh, are focused in on one particular moment. And it was my chance to really interrogate why, why do we still care about Daleks? They've been around since the very, the, like the, the second uh, serial of Doctor Who. Like, why do we care about these tiny fascist pepper pots? Um, why are the Cybermen so important? Why have certain villains fallen by the wayside? And why are other ones still relevant? And it was really fun to reduce that uh, and find a new story, because on one side, there are so many Dalek stories and I had to try and find something that hadn't been said and it was fun. On one side I had to go as far as possible into the lore to find something that wasn't being said and on the other side I had to find what really interested me because this was my first Doctor Who book so the things I like maybe haven't been done and it was very challenging and I don't know if anyone here has ever thought about writing tie-in fiction but the deadlines are catastrophic uh, so this was done first to fourth draft in three months, uh, which is why I have gray in my beard now, and um, it was fun. Uh, and uh, it was really, like I hadn't, I hadn't written hard sci-fi before, I hadn't written, um, uh, it, 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 Italian fiction's a really, it, it's, a, it's a really different beast, and it's really interesting. Like with, I, I say this a lot, but um, with Knights of the Bar of Dark, I just had to be good 
Whereas with this, you had to be good, and also you had the danger of being wrong. Like, lots of people know Tom Baker's Doctor. I hadn't invented that character, but I did have to do a good... Like, it's like being a cover band, but you have to really do it. <laughs> you have to really do it well, because there's a lot of angry Led Zeppelin fans in the audience, and they will tell you. Um, but it was a delight, and um, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, did, I did as well, we have an audiobook of it, and I do my own audiobooks, and I do a lot of performance, and uh, I thought I was pretty okay, uh, but the other two people doing the, I did four stories, and the other two people doing the stories were um, Pippa Bennett Warner, who was in the Time Heist episode of Doctor Who, and then Nicholas Briggs, who's the voice of the Daleks. So I was like, okay, I did a pretty good job. And I listened to his story. I was like, oh, God, <laughs> I'm terrible. He's amazing. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Speaking of performance, I've heard, um, obviously I haven't seen, that your, your book tours are <laughs> quite something. I like yelling at children. But, uh, <laughs> but sa sanctioned yelling, good yelling, mm -hmm. positive yelling. Yeah, I, I, I used to be a teacher, and I do a lot of performance, and... There's a part, uh, for those of you who are aspiring authors, there's a part after you sell your book, but before it comes out, you will probably have a chat with your publisher where they ask you what you're willing to do in terms of publicity. Uh, and so I had a chat with, my, with, with, with Puffin, with my publisher, and they first of all asked me what I like to write articles about certain things, and I said, sure. And then they said, um, do you do events at all? And I said, yeah, like I've done a lot of storytelling. Uh, I, I've... I've spoken in a lot of, I've done poems in a lot of pubs for drunk people, um, I, I would love to do that. And so I have done 522 events since the first book came out three years ago. Uh, I've spoken to, the most amount of kids I've ever spoken to at once is 750. I'm currently going to beat that on Friday, tomorrow with 1200, which is a lot. Um, and it's the best thing in the world because I never met an author until I was in my 20s. And I, you know, if you want to be a doctor, it's an, it's an extremely difficult job to get into, but you do know how to do it. I mean, you, you go to college, you study, it is difficult, but there is a linear path. Whereas the more I uh, researched how to become an author, the more confused I got, because there are so many different paths and so many people who made it big on their first book and so many people where it took like six books and so many people who like wrote blogs and then got picked up and like it's really confusing um, so for me in an author event it's like I get to be the receptionist for the, for the, for the career and I get to talk to these 8 year olds or these 16 year olds or, or 20 year olds or whoever and I get to answer their questions really honestly and I take that extremely seriously because you can so easily discourage somebody by being rude or by being short with them and you could have been having a uh, a tough day or you just got a rejection letter that morning mm. and somebody for the fifth time that day says where do you get your ideas and all you want to do is say I make them up thanks but you have to be you know you're holding that kid's like inspiration in your hands you have to be really um, you have to be just really good to them uh, and, it's, and it's really rewarding and it's really fun um, there's a story that I always think of uh, I was I was in a school and I was selling books at the at the lunch at lunchtime and this little eight-year-old girl came in uh, and she's very small, big Funko Pop head, and uh, she was like, um, I don't have any money for a book, but I have a question. And I was like, okay, get out. No, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> and I was like, what, what's your question? And she was like, do people ever criticize you? And I was like, yeah, do, do people ever criticize you? And she's like, do you, and like, you know when kids have to get something out and their eyes glaze over and they're not really listening to you? She's like, do people ever criticize you and they tell you you can't be an author and they tell you you're never going to write a book? What do you do when people say that? What do you do? And I was like, and I just knew how important this moment was. And I was like, okay, um, the people who told you this, are they authors? And she was like, no. And I was like, then how do they know? And I was like, you have the sensitivity to worry about this and the bravery to come here and ask me. And I can tell you, those are the two things you need to be an author. And she was like, well, but what do you do when they say you can't? And I was just like, picture the looks on their faces <laughs> when they can't walk by a bookshop without seeing your name. And she just went, 
<laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna give you a copy of my trilogy. This is not a gift, this is a promise, because 20 years from now, you're gonna be signing a book and you're gonna give one to me, okay? And she's like, okay, and stormed off. <laughs> Presumably to burn down their house. Uh, <laughs> but I, I just know what it was like being a kid when people were being hugely discouraging. And if I have a chance to flip that for some little eight-year-old, like... And, I, and I, I've had people kind of say, you know, oh, you're kind of lying to kids when you say that anyone can be an author. And I was like, well, anybody can. If you can't, you'll find that out by yourself. I'm not going to tell you that. You should at least try, you know? So, yeah. I didn't have kids. Um, oh, lately, I mean, <laughs> uh, Anna Burns won the Booker. Yeah. Uh, you've got Louise O'Neill, uh, Rick, Rick O'Shea, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Yeah, I know you're doing an event with him as well. Um, he's got his now a radio show where you can talk about books. Yeah. And he's got his book club. Well, what's happening? Why, why all of a sudden? <laughs> it's, 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 I don't know, becoming public again. Yeah, I'm not sure. We're, we're very, very lucky that Ireland has always been. A, a country full of authors and I think that uh, especially with, with, with children's fiction um, you know we've got Owen Colfer we have Darren Shan we have Derek Landy um, there's a new sort of generation you have Louise O'Neill Maura Ferry Doyle Sarah Griff Deirdre Sullivan Kat Doyle there's uh, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure if it's the fact that one we are all storytellers and that is something that uh, you're kind of immersed in from a young age I think some of it as well, especially with being a fantasy author, is that we're very close to our myths and legends at home. Ireland's such a weird mix of being a, you know, a, a quite an affluent first world country, but also we're so connected to our sort of, um, like, okay, so for example, my dad will hate me telling the story. Uh, I apologize. Um, my dad is a small, grumpy man. Do you guys have Captain Birdseye over here? The guy with the fish yeah, yeah, Captain Birdseye. Yeah. Captain Birdseye. Yeah. Um, but he, or Garden Gnome. Um, and he, uh, he's very, very practical. Like, he, when I gave him my first book to read, he was like, yeah, it's very long. <laughs> like, Thanks. Um, but I sprained my ankle a few years ago, and Dad was like, oh, you should go down the village and, and talk to Mrs. Murphy and get the cure. And I was like, what's the cure, Dad? He's like, oh, well, you know, she's the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter, and she, uh, she says a prayer over this wee piece of string, and you wrap it around your, uh, your, your ankle, and it's cured. And I was like, Dad, that's magic. <laughs> and he's like, it's not magic, Dave, it's the cure. And I was like, Dad, that's magic. That you're talking about magic. That is sorcery, Dad. You're a warlock. And he was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a warlock, you're doing um, But we do have this sort of, uh, like, um, I was on Twitter the other day, and somebody was talking, like, you know these um, people will put up, people will ask blogs or Reddit for advice, and this woman was saying that she wasn't feeling well because she was going to the local fairy fort at home, which is what, is, is what we used to call um, sort of like stone age settlements. You'd see this huge like hump and these rocks sticking out, and we call it like a fairy fort. And this woman was saying that she was feeling ill because she'd been going up picking and drying out mushrooms she'd picked on the fairy fort. And every Irish person who saw that was like, Oh, Jesus, I wouldn't go up to the... You'll annoy the fairies now, you wouldn't... Because <laughs> Irish fairies are, like, seven foot tall, incredibly slender, and they steal children. Like, this is... Our, our myths are really, like, blood-sucked. Um, and we're very... We're very close. I mean, we don't believe it, but also we're not going to mess with it, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, and then I think as well, possibly a part of it is that uh, in Ireland, uh, we... There isn't the same rever. I guess, I guess we're, we're closer to authors and closer to publishers. We're a small country. Everyone kind of knows everybody. And it is entirely possible that you'll go to an author event and end up having pints with the author afterwards. We don't do. I've heard that in New York and even in London, you'll go to an author event and then they are kind of spirited away and you don't see them. Whereas at home, generally, you could end up having pints with Anne Enright, you know, um, and... Uh, uh, and having the chats, and it's kind of, it's e maybe it's easier to get a glimpse into the industry, I guess, and so more people kind of get published. I think I'm not. I think there's a, there's a lot of different factors. And well, what's what's next? I know there's an anime, but uh, how about <laughs> yeah, it's far it's far from anime I was raised. Um, it's so there's a, there's a lots lots of bits and pieces. Uh, I'm currently working on another Doctor Who book, which. 
I just realised you can totally not can tell anybody about it, please. I'm not talking <laughs> to anybody. <laughs> um, so I'm working on that, and that's really fun because now I'm in competition with myself to try and find stories, new stories, um, which is really exciting. Uh, I'm currently working on one called uh, Christmas with the Plasma Wars, which is really fun. Um, I am also working on my first YA novel, which is about a small country that has been, it's a fantasy world, it's a small country that has been taken over by its larger neighbour and they've outlawed mm. the language and the culture and the history, mm. not naming any names. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, this is what I mean about like, you know, oh, I don't write about myself. <laughs> but, um, uh, but basically the, the smaller country's gods come back and they're huge and they're terrifying and suddenly the larger empire is in massive retreat. And my story is about this girl called Sister Wake who was staked out as a human sacrifice the day the gods came back, but instead of being killed, is now the saint of the god of death. So she hires herself as a necromancer out to armies. Um, her business card says, life is cheap, I am not. Um, and it's fun. Like, I mean, people have done necromancy before, but I am... In, in my version of it, it's kind of a negotiation because the second the thing realizes it's dead, it will die. So she has to sort of like um, find what that beetle or lizard or rat wanted most in the world. It's kind of, it's kind of speaking the language of the dead in order to like, it's, it's, it's fun. Um, and then I'm also working on um, a couple of different TV shows that I'm like uh, pitching at different places. Because I really like writing for TV is more is, is more casual, but also more fun for that. Um, there's a there's a Knights of the Bar deck, hopefully TV show getting made, and hopefully also an anime where we're just you're just fighting uphill the whole time. Um, uh, and I remember pitching the anime at um, this businessman over Skype, and he's just this like really like just he looked like Colorado, like he's had this sort of like like crumply face, and um, uh, I had been warned before doing the Skype. This is not a man who makes a lot of facial expressions. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like a big kid most of the time anyway, so I was feeling very nervous. And he was just like, mm hmm, mm hmm. <laughs> and finally, I, I finish and he says, I don't want you to mistake my obvious enthusiasm <laughs> for politeness. Let's make this show. <laughs> Can you put a dog in it? And I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, can you put a dog in it? And I was like, yeah! Put a dog in it right there. I put 20 dogs in it. Um, so it's a lot of weird. A lot of meetings with very strange people. But um, yeah, I'm kept busy. Kept out of trouble. Uh, great, great. Um, okay, what is the one question that you've always wanted to be asked that has never been asked? Ooh, <laughs> that's good. I like that. Um, I don't know, because I do, at the end of all of my events for kids, I have 15 minutes of questions. Like, I have a free signed book for the best question, and I have been asked a lot of really weird questions. Uh, I had a kid say once, uh, I have a question. Have you been to prison? <laughs> and I was like, no. Why? And he's like, just a vibe, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thanks. Um, I... I was in a school in Germany and this girl put up her hand like a snake unfolding from a basket. It's like... <laughs> I have und question. And I was like, what's your question? And she said, tell us about your first breakup. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> so 10 minutes and four diagrams later, she's crying, <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers crying. It's a nightmare. Um, what would I like to be asked? Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I actually don't. I, I, I have no idea what would be a good like. Like, because I get, I, I, I do so many events. I do get asked most things. I don't know if there's a question that I don't like being asked. Because, um, like, you'll get kids who ask, where do you get your ideas from? Where do you get your inspiration? How do you get ideas? And I try and answer each of those questions in a different way that still hangs together because often a kid will just want the chance to talk to you and you should like respect that. 
Um, and then you get a lot of kids being like, I have a question. And you go, what's your question? And they go, I forgot. <laughs> and you're like, cool, that's um, okay. Um, uh, and then if I'm talking to very, very young kids, you'll go, they'll say, I have a question. And you go, what's your question? And you go, my dad is a, he got me a puppy, and then one day the puppy uh, fell over, and, and you're like, uh-huh, and then they'll just peter out, and you go, good chat. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Do you, have a, do, you have a, do you have a question that, does anyone here have like a, a, a question you've always want to ask an author, but you're too afraid they'll take it badly? Yes. Oh, that's really, really interesting. Um, so, uh, uh, Grania Wales, like, a, and I'm probably going to get like bits of this wrong, was just this like fire haired Irish pirate queen rock star. And I, I don't think I, I don't think I would like write a singular book about her because I, I haven't, I haven't thought a lot about doing like historical fiction. Like, I would definitely draw on, I think pirate queens are fantastic and there should be a lot more of them, and I would probably draw elements of it, but I have, and I have a lot of respect for people who delve into, I think the amount of research you have to do uh, for historical fiction is amazing, but it's not something I've thought about, but now I probably will think about it. Well, you can have that one. Oh, no, you should write it. You write it, and I'll read it, and I'll blur it. <laughs> uh, we'll both write competing versions. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, I was going to ask if the audience wants to ask a question now. At this point. Hi. Hi. Um, is there any other canon or um, setting that you'd like to write for? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I would. I loved tie-in fiction as a, as a kid because um, I come from a really, really small village and my parents, the only way they could keep me quiet was by bringing me to every single library around. And um, because all the libraries were very small, because it was rural Ireland, I just read every single book in them. Uh, so I, I've read more Danielle Steele than most eight-year-old <laughs> boys should have read. Uh, Ma'am, what's a bodice? Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I would have read a lot of... My first introduction to Star Wars and Doctor Who were the, were the expanded universe books, not the, not the films. Um, and I would love to write for... I'd love to write for Warhammer. I'd love to write for, uh, I'd love to write for X-Men specifically. I'd love to write uh, Magic, Ileana Rasputin, and I'd love to write Nightcrawler. Um, I would probably do a, I don't think I'd do a Star Trek book justice, just because I do like Star Trek, but I'm not like, I don't love, love it. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing some Star Wars. Yeah, I think, I think there's a real fun challenge adopting a new voice and trying to find a new story within the stuff that we already know. Because you're working under the, like, we know what the Eighth Doctor is like, we know what the Fourth Doctor is like. So you have to find something new, but also pay homage to what's gone before. And, like, there's a really nice feeling when you take on time in fiction because you find out just how much it means to some people. Uh, my favourite story in the anthology is... The Jadoon story. So, for those of you who aren't Doctor Who fans, the Jadoon are the Jadoon are big rhino policemen. They're nobody's favorite alien. They're just big rhino cops. Um, and I had to write a Jadoon story. So I was like looking through the Wikipedia's and going back and watching old episodes. And I was talking to my friend Sarah Griff, who's a fantastic YA author. And she was like, "You're writing a Doctor Who book. I have to tell my mom." And I was like, "That's." Odd. Why, why, do you have to, why do you have to tell your mum? And she told me Patricia Kiernan, her mother, had been bullied out of liking Doctor Who when she was a 10-year-old in 1970 in Ring's End in Dublin because she was going to a school run by nuns and the nuns were like, girls don't like science. And Patricia was like, but I do like science. They were like, well, girls don't like science and there's no point in you liking science because you won't get to be a scientist. And Patricia had never gone on to become a scientist and she, she loved Doctor Who. She fell in love with physics because of dollhouses, little tiny things that are very important. And when she told me this, I was like, oh, do you want me to put her in the Doctor Who universe? And she was like, oh my God, are you serious? And I was like, let me go and ask the BBC. Cause, 
And the BBC, um, at the time it was before the, the 13th Doctor had come out, and they had told me, you're not allowed to do a 13th Doctor story because the show hasn't come out, and we can't have you leading the personality or talking with the personality before everyone gets to see it. And I was like, okay, cool. So I wrote it anyway. And uh, it's a story about a girl growing up in the 70s, and she, uh, a Jadoon calf slash baby, lands in the, through the roof next door. And she has to basically look after this huge rhino and try and figure out why it has hands and all this kind of stuff. And she like goes in to ask the, uh, the nuns for books on rhinos and they're very suspicious and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and it's a 13 Doctor story because of course it is. And when I sent it to my, uh, to my publisher who had expressly told me not to do one, he just came back and went, yeah, I cried, fine, and keep it in. I was like, cool, great. Um, and that's, that, like, Patricia Kiernan is now officially Doctor Who canon. Uh, she's on the wiki and everything. And, like, it's cool to, it's a big, it's a great responsibility and a really cool thing to take on something that belongs to so many people and to add to it. So, that's nice. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Any more? Yes, at the, at the back there. Have you ever thought of mashing up traditional tales to make up your own stories? Um, have I ever thought of mashing up traditional tales to tell my own stories? I have done that a little bit. I think that is a really great way of, of um, it's a really great thing to write about because I think that uh, not enough people know, or even in Ireland, not enough people know our traditional stories. And I think that bringing those into the current world or taking two and bringing them together is really fascinating. It's also really big right now in publishing. So Rick Reardon, who writes uh, Percy Jackson, he has just started his own publishing house where he is trying to get, as, so he took on Greek mythology and Norse mythology, but he's reaching out to authors from all other countries to tell, you know, like Irish stories or Maltese stories or, or Indian stories and actually get them to do it instead of maybe somebody from America or somebody from whatever taking those stories. So I think if that's something, uh, I, I like telling Irish mythology. If you're interested in telling mythology, like your background, I think that's really exciting, and I think that actually there's a lot of people looking for that right now. But um, I do, I do think that's really cool. I think that's really interesting. Anyone else? Hi. Hi. How, how much time do you spend on social media, and how important do you think that is for an author to have a presence on that? That's a great question. Uh, I hate social media because um, I'm really bad at it. Because um, I'm not, uh, I'm not what you'd call a polished person, um, as evidenced by my hoodie and my hair. Um, social media is unfortunately, it's it's very important. I think that you um, you don't have to be on every social media platform as a writer, but probably the best thing to do is to pick one. And, and be good at it. I think that uh, a public, so there's two sides to this. When you're starting off as an author, the most important thing to do is, uh, is to work on your own writing. I think it's a good idea to have a Twitter account to follow agents and agencies and publishers to see what they're looking for or to see what their submission process is. Never contact an agent over Twitter, but you'll often see an agent tweeting, okay, I'm closing my uh, submission window now because I'm going on maternity leave or I am going on holiday, and that's useful insider info to know. Or you'll see, oh, I'd love to, to see a traditional tale brought into the real world. I'm dying for that kind of submission. And you've just written that so you could send it in. And that's the pre getting published. When you get published, and I wish I could have told myself this previously, pick one form of social media and be good at it. And by be good at it, I mean either uh, only engage with it minimally and don't only put up sort of publicity related things like here's me at another event or here's a giveaway. Or if you're good at social media, if you're like quippy on Twitter or if you're um, good at Instagram stories, I hate all this stuff. Like I, I find that like my only interest on Twitter is is like chatting with my mates and stuff. I don't think I probably ever sold a book over Twitter, um, but I think it's useful to be honest because 
lots of schools are on it, and I do lots of school events, or you'll see people do competitions, or you'll see things like that. It's too useful a resource to ignore, but you could get lost spending your entire time on social media as opposed to writing. The, the core of everything is the work getting done. After that, um, pick one, have a bit of a presence, because in case one needs to contact you, but yeah, it's, 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 it's very important, but it's not, um, I don't know how useful it is, basically. You spend a lot of time? I spend a lot of time, I spend a bit of time on Twitter, uh, I don't use Facebook anymore because most of my mates have sort of graduated off Facebook. Um, uh, but I do have a page there that I would often get a lot of comments from teachers of schools and things like that, uh, which has gotten me gigs and things, and that's been important. Um, I have an Instagram where most of the people following me are kids, actually, uh, because kids generally, kid, no, no, no kid has Facebook, um, and no kid has Twitter. Um, but a lot of kids will have Instagram. So that's mostly photos from gigs and things like that. But I wouldn't really, uh, I don't get into, obviously I don't get into conversations with kids on it and stuff like that. Uh, and then I have a Reddit account that I use just for looking up stuff about Warhammer, which I like. Um, I could afford to spend less time in it, but I do have a presence on these things. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I can two things combined. Um, you said that uh, whenever you get published, you there's a point where you have like a conversation with your publisher about marketing. Mm. Um, and I'm actually currently having that conversation with right. my publisher. Um, and Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and you also said you're kind of like an anxious person. Yeah. So how do you kind of marry those two things? Like being anxious in terms of, I don't know, you, but... Um, yeah, how do you combine like that anxiety with marketing and publicity and that kind of stuff? That is a brilliant question. So, one of the one of the things that I sort of like in, in that in that early conversation, there was a two year lead in for me selling the night strategy to um, to it coming out, and in that time, I had a lot of time to think about what being a public figure was going to be like. Um, and a big part, so a big part of that was the fact that like my teenage years, I had, um, I had a problem with self-harm and my arms have quite bad scars. And so when it came to thinking about being an author, I knew that if I was going to do events and if I was going to do interviews, somebody would probably ask me about that. If only for the fact that I couldn't wear long sleeves for I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I, could, I, I could, don't deal with hot weather well. I was going to have to wear short sleeves eventually. And so my agent and I had a really uh, frank conversation about that. And this is why I always recommend authors get an agent, because an agent is on your side. And is a publisher, you sell a book to them or two books or three books, and they're good and they're lovely, but they're interested in so getting those books. Whereas an agent hopefully will be with you for life. So I was able to say um, to my agent, Claire, this is, I have a bit of a concern about this, uh, but I've been thinking about what I would, would say in these situations someone asked me, and we talked about that. And I, maybe because I have, a lot of, I have a background of working with kids, I had applied that teaching experience to how I would talk about mental health stuff and how I did want to talk about it because it's important to me and if I can make things easier for kids, I will. But also, as a teacher, you obviously have boundaries. And I was, I was like, I think I can hold those boundaries and I don't want to get into talking about very personal stuff. And we, she was like, I think you should tell your publisher. So I told them and they were actually brilliant about it. They were really, really kind. And they were like, is this something you want to talk about? Or is this something you just want to like not talk about whatsoever? And I said, I am happy to talk about it. I, this is the positive slap that I want to take, which is that writing in a very real way saved my life. And if you're angry and if, you have, if you're suffering from depression and anxiety, here are the positive ways you can turn that around and, um, and use, use that anger in a constructive way, in an artistic way. And uh, going from there, and, going, and also uh, they were like, do you want to do events? And I was like, yes. And look, I'm very lucky in that I am a really anxious person, but I've done a lot of teaching and my anxiety manifests itself as a desperate desire to please and a desperate desire to, uh, to, to, to get things done. 
So um, I was like, no, I want, I want to be able to do these events. But they were very much like, look, it is your, um, it is only to your comfort level. They were like, we want you to be happy. If you're happy in a very practical sense, you will continue writing and you will continue writing our books. So if you don't want to do this stuff, don't do it. If it's going to impact your mental health, don't do it. The most important thing for you as an author is preserving yourself so you can create more books. You're not, uh, you are an entertainer, but you're not a performer if you don't want to be. And three or four years now into writing, a lot of my friends who would have said yes to everything at the start, even though they know it's going to take a toll on them, are now pulling back massively and turning down everything except the essentials because they have worked themselves to the bone and they've put themselves in situations that were stressful or unpleasant or just not what they want to do. I, because of teaching, I'm very happy walking to a room of 414 year old boys and getting them to care about stuff. But that's not everybody's cup of tea and it doesn't have to be. You're not beholden to events or things like that. What you can do if you want to try doing events is you can be very clear on the type of events you will do. So maybe, um, are you writing for kids and young people or are you writing for adults? Young adults. adults. So for example, with secondary schools, which are, I would say a little bit tougher than primary schools, you can offer to do school visits, but only do uh, workshops for like 30 kids and get it to be a sign up event. So you're only getting the kids who really want to meet an author and you're not getting the, like I get like the kids who, um, they're only in school because that's where the bus stopped and they don't want, um, they're like, I got into school and this big lad and like, and who are you? And, like, the first question I ever got asked by an audience of kids, um, I was like, so yeah, blah, blah, blah. And this one boy goes, I have a question. Do you think you're cool? <laughs> <laughs> and because I was a teacher, I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, okay, fair enough, sorry. <laughs> so, um, and we can talk about this more like afterwards, I'll be around and stuff. So um, only do the things that um, will make you not stressed and only do the things that suit you. Every author is different as to what suits them, but stick to what keeps you happy because if you're happy, you'll keep writing. And don't feel you have to work for anybody else, basically. Very good question. Uh, do you have... No, no, no more? The... Uh, cool. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. Sorry, one last one. Okay, okay good last one. Go ahead, I asked one already. All right, all right. As a reader, it just feels that like everything. Sorry, as a reader, it feels like everything at the moment is written for television or written for Netflix. Yeah. How do you park that when you're writing? So um, everything being okay. So um, if everything nowadays feels like it's written for TV, how do I sort of park that? Oh, do you feel like that's what authors? It just feels like that at the moment that everything is written for with Netflix or TV or a movie in mind. And it's not something I, I do think about the, uh, the cinematic potential of my, um, of my work only because the way I plan out scenes is by playing it as a movie in my head. Um, and I, I, I'm sure there are people who write stuff hoping that someone's just going to grab it as a book deal. But if you do that, um, you're not concentrating on telling a good story. I know that like TV, because of streaming systems, um, TV companies are obsessed with like dragging in content and they're buying the option for lots of things. I would guarantee you 1% of those things are actually going to get made. Um, and I think that if you, if you write for adaptation, you're not writing for an audience. I would focus on telling the best story you can because even the most unfilmable or what you think would be really unfilmable a director and a screenwriter could make it filmable anyway. Focus on the medium you're working in, which is the book, because there are so many advantages to writing. Like you, voiceovers, you can't really do as much anymore on TV. Whereas I love writing novels because you get to be inside everybody's head and you get to like have your lurid descriptions. And I would always focus on that. Anything after that is a bonus, basically. Cool. Okay, now we really have to go. Do you have okay. to go? Um, I'm going to be hovering around outside, so if you have questions you didn't get to ask, feel free to come and chat. Thank you very much. Okay, so. uh-huh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.